In 1992, Electromotive Division held 70% of the North American locomotive market. They were untouchable. Railroads didn't buy locomotives, they bought EMD. The company had dominated American rails for over half a century, their two-stroke diesel engines pulling freight across every major line from the Atlantic to the Pacific. General Motors Locomotive Division was printing money, and everyone knew the name EMD meant reliability, power, and dominance. But in just 15 years, that empire would collapse so completely that by 2007, EMD's market share had plummeted below 15%. General Electric didn't just beat them, they annihilated them. The swing represented over $3 billion in lost orders, thousands of jobs, and the complete destruction of a manufacturing dynasty that seemed unbreakable. This is the story of how a century of dominance died, not from a single catastrophic failure, but from arrogance, technological stubbornness, and a series of engineering disasters that turned EMD's greatest strength into their fatal weakness. This is the war that redrew the entire landscape of American railroading. To understand how far EMD fell, you need to understand how high they stood. In 1922, General Motors acquired the Electromotive Corporation, a small company building experimental gasoline electric rail cars. By 1939, EMD had revolutionized the industry with the FT, the first fully diesel electric freight locomotive that could actually replace steam power economically. Railroads loved it. The diesel didn't need hours to build steam pressure. It didn't require water stops every 100 miles. It started instantly, delivered consistent power, and could be operated in multiple units by a single crew. The secret was EMD's two-stroke diesel engine design. While most diesel manufacturers used four-stroke engines, EMD's two-stroke 567 engine fired on every revolution instead of every other revolution. This meant more power from a smaller, lighter package. The engine breathed through a roots blower, a mechanically driven supercharger that forced air into the cylinders since two-stroke designs don't have dedicated intake strokes. The result was an engine that produced incredible power density and could handle the punishment of continuous heavy loads. By 1960, steam was dead, and EMD owned the corpse. Their 567 engine had evolved into the 645, 16 cylinders, 3,000 horsepower, and legendary reliability. Railroads operated on thin margins. Downtime meant lost revenue. EMD locomotives ran for months between major services, and when they did need work, every mechanic in every railroad shop knew the 645 engine inside and out. Parts were standardized, training was universal. EMD had built such complete market saturation that buying anything else seemed financially reckless. General Electric made locomotives too, but they were the afterthought. The spare tire. GE had partnered with Alco, American locomotive company, to build diesel electrics, but they were always the number two choice. When Alco collapsed in 1969, GE absorbed their locomotive division and kept building, but EMD's dominance seemed permanent. In 1983, EMD introduced the SD50, a 50 model designation that symbolized their half-century rule. They controlled 75% of the market. The company was so confident, they barely bothered innovating. Why fix what wasn't broken? That arrogance was the crack in the foundation. While EMD rested on their legacy, General Electric was learning. GE's locomotive division operated in the shadow of EMD's empire, but they were studying every failure, every complaint, every minor frustration railroads had with their equipment. GE's four-stroke FDL engine, developed from the old Cooper Bessemer designs Alco had used, was heavier and larger than EMD's two-stroke, but it had advantages that GE was slowly refining. Four-stroke engines were fundamentally more fuel efficient. They had dedicated intake, compression, power, and exhaust strokes which meant better combustion control and lower emissions. The FDL didn't need a roots blower constantly forcing air into the cylinders, which reduced parasitic power loss and mechanical complexity. GE engineers realized that as fuel prices climbed and environmental regulations tightened, these advantages would matter more than raw power density. In 1984, GE launched the Dash 7 line. They were solid locomotives, but railroads still defaulted to EMD. The real breakthrough came in 1993 with the Dash 944 CW GE had spent years improving the FDL engine's reliability, reducing maintenance intervals, and most importantly, building a microprocessor controlled engine management system that optimized performance in real time. The Dash 9 matched EMD's power output but delivered better fuel economy and lower emissions. More critically, 
GE priced them aggressively and backed them with service contracts that guaranteed uptime. Railroads started noticing. The Dash 9 wasn't just competitive. It was cheaper to operate over its service life. GE salesmen walked into railroad procurement offices with spreadsheets showing life cycle cost advantages. They offered financing deals EMD couldn't match. They promised parts availability and technical support that was responsive instead of bureaucratic. GE was hungrier. They wanted market share badly enough to undercut, outservice, and outhustle the dominant player. But GE didn't win the war because they tried harder. They won because EMD handed them the victory through catastrophic engineering failures. In 1992, EMD introduced the SD70 series, the locomotive that was supposed to secure their dominance into the 21st century. The SD70 used an upgraded 710G3 engine, a 16-cylinder two-stroke beast producing 4,000 horsepower. EMD's engineers had refined the design, adding electronic fuel injection and microprocessor controls to compete with GE's technology. On paper, the SD70 was the most advanced locomotive EMD had ever built. In practice, it was a disaster. The 710 engine's electronic control system started failing catastrophically. The microprocessor modules, sourced from suppliers EMD had pressured to cut costs, couldn't handle the vibration and heat environment inside a locomotive. They would glitch, causing the engine to dump fuel improperly or shut down completely. Locomotives died in the middle of revenue service. Railroads found themselves with brand new $4 million machines sitting dead on sidings while repair crews tried to diagnose intermittent electrical gremlins. The two-stroke design that had been EMD's advantage became their liability. Two-stroke diesels run hotter and dirtier than four-strokes. The roots blower, which had provided that signature EMD power density, was now a maintenance headache. The blower required constant lubrication, and if oil delivery failed, the blower seized, destroying the engine. The 710's increased power output pushed the two-stroke architecture to its thermal limits. Cylinder heads cracked, pistons failed. The engine that was supposed to be EMD's salvation was grenading itself. Meanwhile, railroads were discovering that GE's Dash 9 just worked. The four-stroke FDL didn't have blower issues because it didn't need a blower. GE's electronics were ruggedized and redundant. When a Dash 9 did have a problem, GE's service network responded fast and parts were available immediately. EMD's quality control had become so poor that railroads started calling the SD70 Super Disappointment 70. The jokes spread through the industry like wildfire. Burlington Northern, one of EMD's most loyal customers, ordered 200 GE-944 CWs in 1994. It was the largest single locomotive order in years, and it went to GE. Other railroads followed, Union Pacific, Norfolk Southern, CSX, they all started shifting orders. EMD scrambled to fix the SD-70's problems, issuing service bulletins and software updates, but the damage was done. Railroads operate on trust built over decades, and EMD had shattered it in less than three years. The financial hemorrhaging was immediate and brutal. Every lost order represented not just the upfront locomotive sale, but decades of parts revenue, service contracts, and rebuild work. When a railroad standardized on GE equipment, their entire supply chain shifted. Mechanics got trained on GE systems. Parts inventories converted to GE specifications. Maintenance facilities retooled for GE procedures. Once that institutional change happened, getting the business back became nearly impossible. EMD wasn't just losing sales. They were losing entire railroad systems permanently. The corporate response from General Motors made everything worse. GM's automotive divisions were struggling through the 1990s, bleeding cash in the face of Japanese competition. The locomotive division, once a profitable side business, was now seen as a distraction. GM executives who understood cars had no comprehension of the railroad industry's long sales cycles and relationship-based procurement. They demanded immediate profit improvements and slashed EMD's research and development budget exactly when the division needed to invest heavily in new technology. EMD engineers watched in frustration as projects to develop cleaner engines and improve electronics got canceled or delayed. The company that had invented the practical diesel electric locomotive was being starved of the resources needed to innovate. Meanwhile, GE Transportation was pouring money into next-generation designs, hiring the best engineers, and building partnerships with railroads to understand their evolving needs. The gap between the two companies wasn't just technical anymore, it was cultural and strategic. By 1998, GE had captured 40% of the market. The empire was crumbling, and EMD couldn't stop the bleeding. EMD might have recovered from the quality crisis if the rules hadn't changed. 
But in 1998, the Environmental Protection Agency introduced Tier 1 emission standards for locomotives. The regulations targeted nitrogen oxides and particulate matter, exactly the pollutants two-stroke diesels produced in abundance. EMD's entire design philosophy was suddenly obsolete. Two-stroke engines are inherently dirtier than four-strokes. They have incomplete combustion because the exhaust and intake events overlap. Unburned fuel escapes into the exhaust stream, creating visible smoke and high particulate emissions. EMD engineers tried to clean up the 710 engine with better fuel injection and exhaust after treatment, but they were fighting the fundamental physics of two-stroke operation. Every fix added cost and complexity. GE's four-stroke FDL met Tier 1 standards with relatively minor modifications. The separate exhaust stroke meant cleaner combustion, GE added high-pressure common rail fuel injection and improved the turbocharger efficiency, and they were compliant. The cost difference was minimal, and railroads saw GE as the future proof choice. Then came the AC traction revolution, and EMD's fate was sealed. Traditional DC traction motors used direct current from the locomotive's generator to power the wheel motors. DC motors are simple and robust, but they struggle with low-speed heavy hauling, exactly what modern freight railroads needed. DC motors overheat when pulling maximum load at low speeds because they draw maximum current while producing minimal cooling airflow. Engineers had to limit starting tractive effort to protect the motors, which meant trains couldn't be as heavy or couldn't climb grades as efficiently. AC traction motors solved this. Alternating current motors produce maximum torque at zero speed and can handle continuous heavy loads without overheating. The catch was the complexity. A C systems required massive inverters to convert the locomotive's DC generator output to variable frequency AC power for the motors. The electronics were expensive and sophisticated, but the operational advantages were enormous. GE introduced the AC 4400CW in 1993, a 4400 horsepower beast with AC traction that could pull heavier trains up steeper grades using less fuel. Railroads doing the math realized they could replace three DC locomotives with two AC units and save millions in fuel and crew costs. The AC4400CW became the best-selling locomotive model in North American history. EMD didn't introduce their AC Traction SD70 MAC until 1994, a full year later. They had been so focused on fixing the SD70's reliability problems that they'd fallen behind on the technology that would define the next generation. Worse, EMD's AC locomotives used a different inverter design than GE's, and early units had their own reliability issues. The SD70 Mac was a good locomotive once EMD worked out the bugs, but by then, GE had already captured the critical mass of orders. The irony was devastating. EMD had actually pioneered AC traction research in the 1980s, running experimental units and proving the concept worked. But corporate short-sightedness and budget constraints had prevented them from commercializing the technology aggressively. They'd handed GE the blueprint, then watched as their competitor executed the vision faster and better. It was like inventing the internet and then losing the browser wars. The Tier 2 emission standards arrived in 2005, tightening the regulations even further. EMD responded with the SD70ACE, using an upgraded 710 engine with advanced fuel injection and exhaust gas recirculation. The engine was cleaner, but it was also more complex and more expensive to maintain than GE's latest evolution, the ES44AC, which used a refined version of the four-stroke GEVO engine. The regulatory environment became a weapon GE wielded with brutal efficiency. Each new EPA tier forced EMD to spend millions re-engineering their two-stroke platform while GE made incremental improvements to their four-stroke design. The development cost disparity meant GE could undercut EMD on price while maintaining better profit margins. Railroad executives saw the writing on the wall. Betting on EMD meant betting on a company fighting an uphill technological battle with one hand tied behind their back. What made the collapse even more painful was watching foreign markets slip away. EMD had dominated international locomotive sales for decades, exporting their proven designs to railways across South America, Asia, and Australia. But as emissions regulations tightened globally and railroads demanded modern AC traction technology, GE's competitive advantages in North America translated directly to overseas markets. Countries that had operated EMD fleets for generations started placing orders with GE. The SD70ACE-P4 locomotives EMD built for Australian mines were good machines, but they arrived late to a market where GE had already established beachheads. The psychological impact on EMD's workforce was crushing. 
engineers and machinists who had spent entire careers building the world's best locomotives watched their company circle the drain. The Lagrange plant had been a source of civic pride, a massive facility where American industrial might produce machines that moved the nation's commerce. Workers saw the production line slow, then stop entirely for certain models. Layoffs came in waves. The guys who'd trained their sons to work the same jobs found themselves telling those sons to look elsewhere for careers. By 2005, General Motors, drowning in automotive losses and facing bankruptcy, decided to sell EMD. The locomotive division that had once been a crown jewel was now a liability. Greenbrier Equity Group and Berkshire Partners bought EMD for $1.5 billion, a fraction of what the company would have commanded a decade earlier. In 2010, Progress Rail, a Caterpillar subsidiary, acquired EMD. The name survived, but the empire was dead. Today, if you watch a freight train roll through America, the odds are overwhelming that you're watching GE locomotives, or their modern successors built by GE Transportation, now owned by Wabtec. EMD still exists. Progress Rail builds new EMD locomotives in Muncie, Indiana, but they're a niche player. Their market share hovers around 10% mostly selling to smaller railroads and export markets. The two-stroke engine, the technology that built EMD's empire, is essentially extinct in new production. Modern emission standards make two-stroke diesels economically unviable. EMD's current production locomotives use four-stroke Caterpillar engines, a final admission that the architecture they championed for 70 years couldn't survive in the modern regulatory environment. GE's dominance is total. The Givo engine, a four-stroke design descended from the old FDL, powers the majority of modern American freight locomotives. Tier 4 emissions compliance, which went into effect in 2015, requires such extensive exhaust aftertreatment that only large manufacturers with deep engineering resources can compete. EMD meets the standards, but they're a distant second. The financial impact of this collapse is staggering. In the 15 years between 1992 and 2007, North American railroads spent approximately $15 billion on new locomotives. EMD's market share drop from 70% to 15% represents over $3 billion in lost revenue, money that went directly to GE. That doesn't account for parts, service contracts, and the loss of future orders as railroads standardized on GE equipment. The ripple effects extended far beyond locomotive sales. EMD's supplier network, companies that manufactured everything from turbochargers to electrical components specifically for EMD designs, saw their contracts evaporate. Small machine shops in the Chicago area that had depended on EMD subcontracting work for generations went bankrupt. The economic devastation spread through entire communities that had grown up around the locomotive industry. The human cost was equally brutal. EMD's Lagrange, Illinois plant, once the largest locomotive factory in the world, closed in 2016. Thousands of jobs disappeared. The institutional knowledge built over decades evaporated. The engineers who understood two-stroke diesel technology retired or moved on, and no one replaced them because the technology was dead. What killed EMD wasn't a single failure, it was arrogance. It was the assumption that dominance was permanent. It was the refusal to acknowledge that their core technology was reaching the end of its viable lifespan. It was the quality control failures that destroyed trust. It was the slow response to emissions regulations and the late entry into AC traction technology. GE didn't just outbuild EMD, they outlasted them. They were patient, they were hungry. They understood that markets don't stay static and technological advantages don't last forever. When EMD stumbled, GE was ready to catch every falling contract. The railroad industry is unforgiving. Reliability isn't negotiable. Innovation isn't optional. EMD learned this the hardest way possible by watching a century of dominance collapse in just 15 years. The two-stroke diesel that made them legends became the anchor that dragged them under. The war is over, GE won, and the $3 billion price tag was just the beginning of what EMD lost.